We're back for some analysis with David Sanger of the New York Times and Washington Post columnist Josh Rogan. Good morning to you both. Good to have you here. Good morning, Larry. Great to be here. You know, David, I want to start with you. I know you've been looking a lot at great power competition. In the last Cold War, Southeast Asia, Asia was an epicenter uh, of this showdown. And once again, we are looking at Asia becoming uh, a real focus here for great power competition, this time directly with China. I wonder how you think the Biden administration is doing so far in countering the balance. Well, so far, a lot better, I think, than most of their predecessors. And in that, I would I would include both uh, President Trump and, and President Obama. Um, they have got a strategy to try to win back the allegiance of countries throughout uh, the Pacific. And so you've seen agreements that have ranged down through the Solomon Islands and New Guinea, places that people really hadn't thought about in the United States very much, up through the Philippines, as you were uh, discussing with uh, Vice President Harris, and with Vietnam. Uh, I remember being on the first trip an American president took to Vietnam. It was Bill Clinton. And it was pretty much all about reconciliation with the war. What I thought was interesting about the president's press conference, which ran just as, as uh, you began the show here, is there was almost no reference to the Vietnam War. It was really all about China itself and its influences, Russia and its influences. And what the president didn't say, as my Times colleagues have reported, is that uh, Vietnam has just signed an arms deal secretly with Russia and did so just before the president arrived. So you're seeing a lot of countries hedging and trying to keep one foot in both camps. And Josh, you were with me <laughs> on that very long uh, transit uh, to Indonesia, and you spoke with Vice President Harris as well. One of the things she, she didn't lay out there, but the broader strategy seems to be building this constellation of countries that don't really like Beijing, but aren't ready to necessarily claim allegiance. They just want a little bit more relationship management here. What is it that you think was accomplished? Right. Well, I think, you know, we talk a lot about the U.S.-China relationship for obvious reasons. But the fact is that the Indo-Pacific strategy is a lot bigger than China. And where the real action is, is with all of these other countries. And we see the geopolitical uh, uh, shifts in the region, Japan and Korea coming to Camp David for the first time. Uh, we see the J Japanese and the Philippines working together more than they ever have before. Uh, this is not caused because of us, but there is an opportunity for the United States to take advantage of these demand signals coming from allies. And I think that's what Vice President Harris was there to do. And I don't know about your opinion, Margaret, but my opinion is that she did it, uh, represented the United States admirably and skillfully and showed that she had a command of the issues and a good rapport with several of these Asian leaders whom she has met with on many trips many times. And did she solve all of the world's problems in 36 hours? No. Mm -hmm. And can she solve the fact that our Indo-Pacific strategy lacks a robust economic and investment component? No. But she did the hard work of meeting with these people and hearing them out. And but what they said to her and to you and to me is very clear, is that they're stuck there in that region with China, whether they like it or not. Right. They want America in the region. They don't know if they can count on our long-term commitment. They would like to see more money on the table. But this was a small step, I think, in the right direction. The, the one part that uh, some of those countries can count on are those countries where there is an actual treaty, right? And I, I think it is worth reminding people that five of our, of our seven treaty allies are in Asia. So the U.S. could get drawn into a conflict. So these skirmishes in the Philippines or things that are happening in these far-flung places actually could pull in U.S. military action and require it, David. Uh, this is our, our biggest risk right now, which is something accidental. You remember that right. the Bush administration, George W. Bush, began with uh, its first big foreign policy crisis was an American plane that collided with a Chinese plane, uh, both intel an intelligence plane and a fighter. And went down, took days to get the, the crew back. Um, Right now, there is so much activity from the South China Sea down through the Philippines um, that that's a big risk. And you mentioned North Korea with her. And obviously, you know, the diplomacy that uh, you saw President Trump uh, engage in ultimately failed. The North Korean nuclear arsenal is larger than it has ever been. They've just brought out a submarine that may or may not be able to carry uh, nuclear weapons. And 
the cooperation that we once had from China and Russia to solve this problem is gone. Right. Why? Because the Russians need arms from the North Koreans. And looks like in the next few days we may see Kim Jong-un show up uh, to, meet, uh, to meet Vladimir Putin. Exactly. Yeah, and that's worth pointing out because when we hear about international rules-based order, that's based on the U.N., and two of those actors you just talked about have veto power there. So we're really seeing this new territory foreign policy-wise. Josh, you know, one of the things that strikes me is how carefully the administration parses and picks its words when it refers to anything having to do with China. Then U.S. Ambassador Rahm Emanuel <laughs> tweeted, and he went there, President Xi's cabinet lineup is resembling Agatha Christie's novel, and then there were none. He's talking about the foreign minister going missing, the rocket force commanders going missing, the defense minister hasn't been seen in two weeks. He said, who's going to win this unemployment race, China's youth or Xi's cabinet? <laughs> Fairly provocative, but pointing to some real internal issues potentially within China's top leadership. Right. I mean, we all know uh, Rahm Emanuel in Japan. I've been to Tokyo recently. They call him the Rahm Ambassador. They call him like a, you know, the 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 junkyard dog that you chain up there, near near the the Chinese that can bark at them. And uh, that's not exactly perfectly coordinated inside the administration, to be honest. But it's not <laughs> as if they're stopping him either. And you saw in your interview with. Uh, Vice President Harris and President Biden's uh, conf press conference. They're very careful when talking very about China. Very careful. And then there's Rahm, and he's not. At, but what he's saying is true that the level of secrecy inside Xi Jinping regime, Xi Jinping's regime is unprecedented. And that, in more than anything else, is what's causing a lot of the uncertainty and risk of miscalculation that could lead to the conflict that nobody wants. So if, if, it, if it has to be Rahm Emanuel that says the obvious, which is that when the foreign minister disappears off the face of the earth, no explanation, that's weird, okay? <laughs> and when they will, are expanding militarily and say, oh, we wanna have good military communication, but we won't establish the military to military hotline, then they're not telling the truth, okay? And these are just facts about our far relationship with China that are unfortunate but need to be spoken so that people understand that uh, in the end, if the Chinese government doesn't want to uh, engage like it says it does, there's not a lot we can do except to rally our allies to defend ourselves, which I think is what they're doing. And we'll see if Xi Jinping ends up coming to America in November, potentially to meet with we're, Joe Biden. We're taking bets. <laughs> yes, unclear. I don't yeah. know what bet you'd take on that one. Um, but I will, I will defer. We're going to have to leave the conversation there, though, and we'll be right back.